Hey folks, before the video starts, please leave a like and subscribe to cheer me up. Make sure you are relaxed and enjoy today's stories. I bought a service on the dark web to erase my debt. The bank records are gone, but so are my friends. All right, so before anyone judges me, let me just say that I wasn't trying to get involved in anything shady. It just happened. You know that feeling when you're drowning in bills and the walls start closing in? Yeah, that was me. Student loans, credit cards maxed out, and the car payment. Oh man, I could barely keep the lights on, let alone save for anything. I had tried everything, budgeting apps, debt consolidation, even working those stupid gig economy jobs on top of my full-time gig, but nothing made a dent. I was at the point where I couldn't even sleep because of the stress. My phone was buzzing every five minutes with collections calls, and I felt like I was suffocating. So, I did what every rational person in their 20s does when they're out of options. I started Googling how to erase debt debt relief. Get rid of collections calls. You get the idea. I came across all the usual scams, obviously, sketchy payday loans, miracle solutions that only seemed to make things worse. But then, deep in one of those endless Reddit threads, someone mentioned something interesting. They said there were services on the dark web that could completely erase your debt, like wipe everything clean from the system, records and all. And yeah, I know how stupid it sounds now, but in the moment, it felt like a lifeline. That's when I found myself spiraling down a rabbit hole I had no business exploring. You always hear about the dark web and how it's this shady underworld of illegal stuff, right? Drugs, fake passports, hitmen, things you think only exist in movies. But what I found was a bit different. There were services, not just sketchy, borderline legal stuff, but things that didn't make any logical sense. People talking about wiping bank accounts, changing criminal records, or even buying luck for gambling. I figured most of it was garbage, but I couldn't get the idea of debt erasure out of my head. The thing is, I had no clue how to access the dark web, but Google exists for a reason. After some digging, I figured out how to download the Tor browser, got myself a VPN, and found my way into the darker corners of the internet. It didn't take long before I landed on a marketplace forum. There were people there, regular folks like you and me, sharing stories about getting their debt wiped clean no more collections calls, no more bank statements showing a negative balance. It was like pressing a reset button on your whole financial life. I knew it was probably a scam, but I was desperate. I scrolled for hours, reading every post I could find. Some people said it worked like magic. Others warned to stay away. There were whispers about strange things happening afterward. People losing jobs or waking up in weird places with no memory of how they got there. But I ignored those. I told myself it was just internet trolls making things sound creepier than they were. After all, if I could get rid of my debt, what was the harm? Eventually, I found what looked like a trustworthy vendor. Well, as trustworthy as someone selling illegal financial services can be. The profile had hundreds of good reviews. People were singing this person's praises like they were some kind of Robin Hood of the financial underworld. Their offer was simple. For 0 0.25 Bitcoin, they'd wipe every trace of my debt from every system. Guaranteed. No more credit card balances. No more student loans no more car payments. I'd be free. 0 0.25 Bitcoin was expensive, sure, but I had been smart enough to put a little crypto aside during the last bull market. 
I figured I'd send the payment and see what happened. Worst case, I'd lose the Bitcoin. Best case, I could finally sleep without waking up in a cold sweat at 3 a.m. So, I made the transfer. After the payment went through, I received a message. It is done. That was it. No details, no instructions, no confirmation. Just those three words. I thought, well, that's underwhelming. A part of me felt a weird sense of relief. Like maybe things were finally about to change. The first thing I did was check my credit card account. I pulled it up on my phone, half expecting everything to still be there. But when I logged in, I froze. The balance? Zero. Completely wiped. Not just the balance, but the transaction history too. Like I had never used the card at all. The same thing happened when I checked my bank account. All those overdraft fees and auto pay failures. Gone. There was no record of me ever missing a payment. Even my student loan portal showed a big fat paid in full. At that moment, it felt like I was floating. It was the first time in months I could breathe. But then the weird stuff started. It was subtle at first, small, almost unnoticeable things. The next couple of days felt surreal. I kept checking my accounts, refreshing pages to make sure it wasn't some glitch. But every time I looked, the numbers stayed the same. Zero balances, no debt, no collections. Even my credit score skyrocketed like I had lived a perfect financial life. I thought maybe I'd found some miracle service. And for the first time in forever, I slept like a baby. But that feeling of peace didn't last. The first sign that something was off came when I tried calling my friend Jared. Jared was one of my closest friends, the kind of guy who'd Venmo me money without a second thought if I was running short. We met back in college and stayed close, even when life got busy. I owed him a few hundred bucks, and now that my debts were wiped, I figured I'd finally pay him back. I shot him a text. Hey man, good news, I can finally pay you back, hit me up. No response. Weird, but not alarming. I figured he was busy. Jared was always either working late or gaming until stupid hours of the night. A few hours passed. I checked my phone, still nothing. So I gave him a quick call. It rang and rang and rang, straight to voicemail. Okay, maybe his phone died. It happens. But when I opened my contacts to try again, Jared's name was gone. At first, I thought I was just being an idiot scrolling too fast or something. But no, his number wasn't there. I searched our old texts. Nothing. No conversations, no pictures, nothing at all to prove we'd ever spoken. Now, here's the thing. I knew I hadn't deleted anything. Jared was on my favorites list. There was no way his contact could just disappear without me noticing. It creeped me out but I brushed it off as some weird phone glitch and told myself, oh, I'd figure it out later. Then I went on Instagram. Jared was gone from there too. His profile wasn't just inactive. It didn't exist. All our messages, gone. All our tagged photos, missing. It was like someone had scrubbed every trace of him off my phone and social media. I sat there scrolling through my contacts again, feeling this heavy knot form in my stomach. That's when I noticed something else. A few other names were missing too. Maggie, this girl I used to hang out with in college, gone. Jason, a co-worker I'd borrowed money from a couple of months ago. His name vanished from my contacts and our text threads too. It was like they'd never existed. But here's the thing that really made my skin crawl. The only people missing were the ones I owed money to. That night, I sat on the edge of my bed, trying to convince myself it was all a coincidence. 
Maybe I had deleted some contacts by accident. Maybe Jared just blocked me for some reason. It was weird, yeah, but it didn't mean anything. Right? Then the phone rang. The caller ID said, unknown, and the ringtone wasn't the one I normally used. It was this weird, glitchy melody that I swear I'd never heard before. It gave me goosebumps. I almost didn't answer, but something compelled me to pick up. Hello? I said. There was silence on the other end. For a second, I thought it might be a spam call, but just as I was about to hang up, I heard breathing. Not the heavy, angry kind. More like the soft, shallow breaths of someone who didn't want to be heard. Jared? I whispered, feeling my heart hammer in my chest. The breathing stopped, and then, in the faintest voice, so faint I could barely hear it, I heard, help me. The call dropped. I stared at my phone, my hands clammy and cold. I tried calling the number back, but of course, there was no record of the call in my recent history. I even went through my entire phone, hoping I had just missed it, but it wasn't there. It was like the call had never happened. I sat there, paralyzed by a creeping sense of dread. Something was wrong. Something was very wrong. And it was starting to feel like whatever I had gotten myself into wasn't just about wiping my debt. The next morning, I decided to track Jared down in person. I knew where he lived. A crappy one-bedroom apartment across town. I drove over, hoping to catch him at home. But when I got there, I found his place completely emptied out. No furniture, no posters, no signs of life. The door was unlocked, and when I peeked inside, it was as if no one had ever lived there at all. I went to the building manager, this cranky old dude who always smelled like cigarettes. Hey, do you know where Jared moved to? I asked trying to keep my voice steady. The guy just gave me a blank stare. Who? Jared Thompson, the guy in 2B. He squinted at me like I was crazy. There's never been a Jared Thompson in 2B. I swear, my stomach dropped right out of my body. I tried to argue with him, but he waved me off, muttering something about wasting his time. I stood there in the hallway, trying to wrap my head around what was happening. Jared's apartment was gone. His phone number was gone. His entire existence was gone. And then it hit me. I hadn't just erased my debt. I'd erased the people connected to it. I felt like I was going to be sick. What had I done? Was this some kind of sick cosmic trade-off? My debt was gone, sure. But now the people I owed money to were being, what, erased, wiped from existence. I sat in my car for what felt like hours, staring at my phone, trying to think of who else might be next. That's when I remembered Jason, my co-worker. I had borrowed $200 from him a while back to cover rent, and I still hadn't paid him back. My heart raced as I called his number. It went straight to voicemail. And just like Jared, his contact was missing from my phone the second I hung up. No texts, no call history, nothing. I was too scared to sleep that night. I stayed up, going over everything in my head, trying to figure out a way to undo whatever I had done. I thought about messaging the vendor on the dark web, begging them to reverse it. But when I went back to the marketplace, their account was gone, like it had never existed. The next morning, I called into work, saying I was sick. I needed to figure this out before it got worse, before someone else vanished. But when I checked my messages, I noticed something strange. The work group chat had one less member. Jason was gone, and no one even seemed to notice. That's when I realized something terrifying. If this kept going, no one would remember these people ever existed. 
It was like they were being wiped from reality, piece by piece. And if I didn't stop it soon, I was next. I didn't leave my apartment for the next two days. I locked all the doors, turned off my phone, and just sat there in the dark, trying to make sense of what was happening. But no matter how much I racked my brain, I kept coming back to the same terrifying conclusion. Somehow, that dark web service didn't just erase debt, it erased people. And not just their debts, it wiped them entirely. The scariest part was realizing how fast it happened. Jared, Jason, and Maggie, gone without a trace, and no one but me even remembered they existed. It wasn't just social media or contacts on my phone. It was everything. I checked old photos, Facebook memories, even yearbooks, and there was no record of them anywhere. It was as if they had never lived in the first place. Then I noticed something even worse. It was spreading. I tried texting a few other friends, people I'd borrowed small amounts of money from, over the years. Most of them responded at first. Things seemed normal. But as the hours passed, the replies started getting weird. Like, really weird. One of my friends, Jenna, sent me this strange message out of nowhere. Hey, how do we know each other again? It hit me like a punch to the gut. She didn't remember me. Just hours before, we were talking like normal. And now it was as if I was some stranger sliding into her DMs. I tried to play it cool and reminded her we went to college together, even sent her an old photo of us. She responded with, I don't think this is me, sorry. And then, just like that, her messages disappeared. Her profile vanished. Another person, gone. I wasn't just watching people I owed money to disappear anymore. Now, even people who remembered that I owed money were starting to go. I realized the rules were changing. It wasn't just about the debts, it was about connections. The moment someone remembered or acknowledged my debt, they became a target. That night, I sat on my couch, staring at the wall, too scared to check my phone, too paranoid to fall asleep. I felt like I was being hunted, like I was balancing on the edge of some invisible knife. One wrong move, and I'd tip over into whatever void had swallowed my friends. And that's when the knock started. At first, they were soft. Just a few taps on the front door. I froze. It was 2 a.m. and I wasn't expecting anyone. My apartment complex is usually dead quiet at that hour, so every knock felt like a gunshot in the silence. Tap. 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 I sat perfectly still, my heart slamming against my ribs. I told myself it was probably just someone at the wrong door. But then I heard it again. Three deliberate knocks, slow and steady. Tap. 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 This time, they were louder. I grabbed my phone with shaking hands and checked the peephole. The whole way outside was dark, but I could see the outline of someone standing there. Just a shadow, perfectly still, like they were waiting for me to open the door. Who's there? I called, my voice cracking. No answer. Just more knocks. Tap. Taps. Tap. Tap. I don't know what possessed me to reach for the doorknob. Maybe it was curiosity. Maybe it was fear. Honestly, I don't even remember making the decision. My hand moved on its own, twisting the lock with a metallic click. The moment I cracked the door open, the knocking stopped. But there was no one there. The hallway was completely empty. Just the flickering light from the exit sign at the far end. I stepped out, glancing left and right. Not a sound. Not a single soul in sight. And then my phone buzzed in my hand. I jumped so hard, I nearly dropped it. When I looked at the screen, my stomach twisted into a knot. It was a notification. A calendar reminder I knew I hadn't set. 
Meeting with Jared. 2.15 a.m. What the hell? My heart raced as I stared at the screen, my thumb hovering over the dismiss button. But before I could tap it, my phone buzzed again. This time, it was a text from a number labeled unknown. The message just said, Don't forget. At that point, I was too freaked out to think straight. I slammed the door shut, threw the deadbolt, and backed away like the thing on the other side might burst in at any moment. I turned all the lights on, grabbed a kitchen knife, and sat on the floor in the corner of my living room, trying to convince myself this wasn't real. That's when the lights went out. The apartment was plunged into total darkness, like the kind of black where you can't see your own hand in front of your face. I swear, my heart stopped for a full second. I fumbled for my phone, but the screen wouldn't turn on. I tried hitting the power button, the volume buttons, anything, but it was like the battery had just died. Then I heard it. Tap, 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 tap. The same knocking, but now it was coming from the inside. I could hear it, clear as day, coming from the walls. The sound moved around the room, slow and deliberate, like someone was tapping their knuckles on the drywall, trying to find a way out. I pressed my back against the cold wall, holding the knife so tight my knuckles hurt. The tapping circled me, first behind the couch, then near the front door, then closer to where I was sitting. Tap, 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 and then it stopped. I held my breath straining to hear anything in the silence. And then, right behind me, I heard someone whisper, so soft it was almost a sigh. You forgot. When the lights came back on, everything was exactly where it had been. My phone sat on the coffee table, the battery at 95%. No missed calls, no strange reminders. Just the same empty apartment, like nothing had happened. But something had happened. I knew it. I could feel it, deep in my bones. And when I checked my phone's calendar again, the meeting with Jared was still there, marked for 2.15 a.m. I deleted the reminder. Five minutes later, it came back. I deleted it again. This time, it stayed gone. But not before my phone buzzed one last time. Another message from unknown. You can't delete what's owed. That's when I knew, without a doubt, that this wasn't going to stop. Whatever I had gotten myself into, it wasn't going to let me walk away. It wanted something, something more than just debt, and I was running out of people to lose. I'm going to stop here for now. I need to figure out what to do next. But if any of you have ever used those weird services on the dark web and know how to reverse this, Please, for the love of God, tell me what to do. Because the next time someone knocks, I might not be able to stop myself from answering. I didn't sleep that night. I sat on the couch with all the lights on, holding the knife in one hand and my phone in the other, waiting for something, anything, to happen. But the knocks never came back. By the time the sun came up, I was a wreck. My eyes burned from lack of sleep. My throat felt dry. My brain was running on fumes. I knew I needed to find answers, but where? Every logical part of me told me this wasn't possible. You can't just erase people from existence. But it was happening, and somehow it was connected to the debt erasing service. I bought off the dark web. I decided to search my phone again looking for anything that might give me a lead, something I'd missed. That's when I noticed a new app on my home screen. I swear, I hadn't installed it. It had no name, just a blank black icon. I hesitated for a second, my heart pounding, then tapped it. The screen went dark for a moment, and then a simple list appeared. It was a list of names. My heart stopped as I read through them, Jared Thompson, Maggie Walsh, 
Jason Herrera, Jenna Cooper, every single person I'd noticed missing, and more. Some of the names were people I barely remembered. Acquaintances from college, old neighbors, co-workers I hadn't thought about in years. It was like someone had gone through my entire life and picked out everyone I'd ever owed money to, no matter how small the amount. But the most chilling part, the names weren't just listed randomly, they were organized by status. Next to each name was a label. Some said erased, like Jared and Maggie. Others said pending. And at the very bottom of the list, I saw my own name. Monitored. I felt like I was going to throw up. My hands were shaking so badly, I almost dropped my phone. This wasn't just some cosmic accident. There was a system to it. A process. And if my name was on that list, it meant I wasn't just a bystander. I was part of it now. I scrolled through the list again, trying to make sense of it. The pending names. Were they next? Was there some kind of order to who disappeared and when? I had no idea, but one thing was clear. If I didn't find a way to stop this, everyone connected to me was going to vanish. And eventually, it would be my turn. I needed to act fast. The first thing I did was delete the app. Or at least, I tried to. The icon wouldn't budge. I held it down, dragged it to the trash. Nothing worked. It was stuck there like it was burned into my phone. I even tried restarting the whole device, but the app came right back the moment the phone rebooted. I needed a new plan, something bigger. If this whole thing started with that dark web vendor, maybe I could trace them, find some way to contact them, or even reverse what they'd done. I fired up my laptop and launched Tor again diving back into the dark web marketplace where I found the service in the first place. But of course, their profile was gone. The listing was wiped, just like everything else. No reviews, no contact info, nothing. But there was one new message waiting for me in my inbox. It was from an anonymous user. The subject line just said, you can't undo it. I clicked it and the message inside was brief. Once the debt is erased, the balance has to be paid, one way or another. That's when it hit me. This was never just about money. It wasn't about numbers in a bank account or credit reports. This was about debt in a much bigger, more terrifying sense. It's hard to explain the kind of fear I felt in that moment. Imagine realizing your entire existence has been part of some invisible transaction, a ledger you didn't even know you were on, and now the ledger was being balanced. The only way out was to pay in full, and if you couldn't, well, people like Jared were the payment. The question now was, how much did I still owe? I went back to the list on my phone, scrolling through it one more time. As I skimmed through the names, I noticed something strange, something I hadn't caught the first time. A small number was listed next to each person's name. Jared had $320 next to his. Jason had $200. Jenna said $50. They were the exact amounts I had owed them. But when I reached my own name at the bottom, the number was terrifying. Zero dollars. Zero cents. At first, I thought maybe that meant I was in the clear. But then it clicked. Zero dollars, zero cents didn't mean I was safe. It meant I had nothing left to give. The system had already taken what it wanted from me. I was tapped out. That's when I understood. The system wasn't just erasing my debts. It was erasing me. Bit by bit, piece by piece. It had started with my connections to other people, but it wouldn't stop there. Eventually, I'd be wiped from the world completely, just like Jared and the others, and no one would remember I existed. 
I was already circling the drain. It was only a matter of time before the finer piece of me was gone. I needed to find someone, anyone who could help. But every time I tried calling someone, their contact disappeared from my phone the second I hung up. It was like the system was one step ahead of me, cutting off every lifeline before I could use it. I thought about going to my parents' house, but a terrible thought stopped me in my tracks. What if they didn't remember me? What if, the moment I showed up at their doorstep, I vanished from their memories too? Could I handle that? I was running out of options, and fast. Then around midnight, the knock started again. This time, they weren't coming from the front door. They were coming from inside the apartment. Tap. Tap, tap. Tap. The sound echoed from the walls, the floors, even the ceiling. It was everywhere at once, surrounding me. I stood there in the middle of the room, clutching the knife, my whole body trembling. And then, from the corner of the room, I heard that same whisper. You forgot. I turned toward the sound, but there was nothing there, just shadows dancing on the walls. And then, my phone buzzed. It was another message from unknown. Last chance to pay. Beneath the message was a button that said, Accept terms. I stared at the screen, my pulse pounding in my ears. I knew deep down that if I pressed that button, there would be no going back. But what choice did I have? If I didn't do something, I'd be next. The knocks grew louder, more insistent. The walls trembled with each tap, like they were about to cave in. I had no time left. With a shaking hand, I hovered my thumb over the button, and just as the knocking reached a deafening crescendo, I pressed, accept. The screen went black, and everything stopped. The knocking, the whispers, the list on my phone, all of it vanished in an instant. The apartment was silent again, as if nothing had ever happened. I sat down on the floor, gasping for breath, my mind spinning. Had it worked? Was it over? But then my phone buzzed one last time. Another message, short and simple. Payment received. And that's when I noticed something chilling in the reflection of my phone screen. I saw something standing behind me. If you think this is the end, it's not. When I saw the reflection, my whole body locked up. It wasn't just a shadow, it was me. Or at least, something that looked like me. Same face, same hair, same clothes. But the eyes, they were wrong. Too dark, too empty. Like the kind of eyes that belong to something wearing a mask. And it was smiling. I whipped around, but nothing was there. Just the empty room, quiet and still. I stared at the spot where it should have been, my pulse hammering so loud it felt like my skull was about to crack. The reflection, it had been so real. I wasn't losing my mind. I knew right then that whatever I had agreed to in that message wasn't over. The system didn't just want payment, it wanted me, or some version of me anyway, and I had just given it permission. I spent the next few hours pacing the apartment, trying to keep my thoughts from spiraling. Every time I thought about what I'd seen, that terrible smile, I felt like I was on the verge of cracking open. I kept glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see it standing there again, waiting to step into my skin. And then, at 3.33 a.m., the lights flickered, my phone buzzed. And without thinking, I picked it up. Another message from unknown appeared on the screen, initiating transfer. Transfer? What the hell did that mean? The lights flickered again, this time longer, as if the power was being sucked out of the room. My phone buzzed a second time, and when I looked down, I saw something that nearly stopped my heart. A timer. 332. 331. 
3.30. It was counting down. I panicked. There was no other word for it. I started grabbing anything I could. My laptop, my car keys, my wallet, and stuffed them into a backpack. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I needed to get out. Whatever that countdown was for, I couldn't be here when it hit zero. I made it to the door and threw it open, but when I stepped into the hallway, the world outside was wrong. The hallway stretched on forever, twisting and bending in impossible ways, like a funhouse mirror gone horribly wrong. Doors lined the walls, but they weren't real doors. They were just painted on. The air was thick and cold, pressing against my skin like wet cement, and in the distance, I could hear it. Tap, 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 tap. I backed into my apartment, slammed the door, and locked it. My hands were shaking so badly, I couldn't even hold the key steady in the lock. I pressed my ear against the door, listening to the taps grow louder, closer, as if they were coming from inside the walls themselves. I checked the timer again. 2.15, 2.14, Time was running out. I was trapped. That's when it hit me. The dark web vendor. If they started this, maybe they could end it. I yanked my laptop out of my bag, hard racing, and booted it up. The screen flickered for a moment, and for a second, I thought it wasn't going to work. But it did. I opened Tor and frantically searched through the marketplace, praying for a miracle. Then, as if the system knew exactly what I needed, the vendor's profile reappeared. But it was different this time. There was no listing for debt relief. No promises of financial freedom. Just a single message written in red text. Debt paid. Transfer in progress. All transactions are final. And beneath that, one lost line that made my blood run cold. What you owe becomes what you are. My stomach dropped. That's what the countdown was. It wasn't just going to erase me. It was going to replace me. I realized too late that I wasn't just some customer who stumbled onto a shady deal. I was part of the balance sheet. The debt had to go somewhere. And now it was becoming me. Or at least some version of me. Something built to fill in the empty space I left behind. I checked the timer again. 105. 104. 103. No time to think. No way to undo it. The system had me cornered. I was out of options. I don't know why I thought it would work. But in a desperate, last-ditch attempt, I grabbed a piece of paper and scrawled out a name. Jared Thompson. I folded the paper and held it tight, whispering his name over and over, like saying it out loud would bring him back. Jared Thompson. Jared Thompson. Jared, I'm sorry. I didn't mean... Before I could finish, the walls trembled, the lights flickered again, and the air turned freezing cold. My breath came out in white puffs, and every hair on my body stood on end. And then, in the corner of the room, I saw it. Not a shadow, not a reflection. It was me. The thing stood perfectly still, its black eyes locked on mine. It was smiling again, that same awful grin that made my skin crawl. And as the countdown hit zero zero, it took a single step forward. I don't remember much after that. Just a sudden crushing darkness, like the walls were closing in, and the feeling of falling. I reached out, trying to grab onto anything, but there was nothing there. Just endless, suffocating black. And then, silence. I woke up on the floor of my apartment, gasping for air. The lights were on. Everything looked normal. My phone sat on the coffee table. No strange apps, no countdowns. For a moment, I thought maybe, just maybe, it was all over. But when I checked my contacts, my heart sank. Every name was gone. Not just Jared, or Jason, or Jenna. Everyone. No texts, 
no call history, no emails. It was like I'd been completely erased from their lives. Or worse, like I'd never existed at all. I checked my reflection in the mirror, and that's when I saw it. The smile. It was small, barely noticeable, but it was there. And the worst part, it didn't feel like my smile. It felt like his. I don't know how long I've been sitting here, writing this. Time feels strange, like it's slipping through my fingers. I tried reaching out to people online, but no one responds. It's like I've become a ghost, trapped between worlds, waiting for someone to notice I'm still here, but no one will. Because the truth is, I'm not really here at all. Not anymore. The system got what it wanted. The balance is paid. I was hired to test a new dating app on the dark web. My match knows too much about me. This all started because I was desperate for cash. I had just lost my part-time job at a local coffee shop. Something about budget cuts, even though I saw them hiring new people the next week. Rent was coming up, and I didn't have a backup plan. So, I did what most broke people do when they're desperate. I hit the internet. I have a bit of a tech background, nothing crazy, but I know enough to keep up with online trends and make a few bucks doing odd jobs on the side. One night, after scrolling through a few freelancing gigs, I stumbled upon a forum I probably shouldn't have been on. It wasn't the usual Upwork or Fiverr type of place. It was more underground. Think dark web adjacent, if that makes sense. I was just browsing, curious to see what kind of weird stuff people were offering. That's when I saw it. A post titled, Seeking Beta Testers for Experimental Social Platform, $500 for one week. The post felt a little too good to be true, but I wasn't exactly in a position to be picky. I clicked it. There were a few paragraphs explaining the details in vague terms. The gig was simple. Try out a new dating app that wasn't released to the public yet. Provide feedback and report any bugs or glitches. No experience necessary. It said payment would be sent through a private PayPal transfer after the trial week ended. It seemed harmless. I figured it might be one of those sketchy startups looking to build hype before an official launch. The kind that pays influencers to fake testimonials and all that. But what stood out to me, what really hooked me, was that payment offer. $500 for a week. All I had to do was chat with people. I thought, hell, it's just a dating app. What's the worst that could happen? The bottom of the post had a link with an invitation code and some instructions. It said to use a VPN, which I already had installed because, you know, dark web stuff. It also warned against sharing any personal information beyond what was necessary for the app. The phrasing was odd, but I brushed it off. I clicked the link. The page I landed on was bare bones, just black text on a white background with a login button in the middle. I created an account using the code from the post, and within seconds, I was in. The name of the app was Eros, which I thought sounded cheesy, but harmless. After logging in, the layout looked pretty normal. Basic profile setup, upload a photo, choose a username, and fill out a quick bio. I figured it would be a good idea to use a burner profile picture, so I uploaded a random selfie I'd taken months ago. A pretty boring one, where I looked tired as hell. I didn't use my real name, obviously. I went with something dumb like Charlie Bean. For the bio, I just wrote, not looking for anything serious, just trying this out for a bit. Once my profile was set up, the app immediately threw me into a chat feature. 
There was no swiping or matching involved, just a list of people already online. The weird thing was, I only saw one profile available to chat with. Usually, dating apps are full of options, but this one just gave me one person, Lily67. Her profile picture was odd. It was black and white, kind of grainy, like it had been scanned from an old photograph. She had long dark hair and wore a plain dress, nothing flashy. She looked normal, too normal, the kind of person you'd forget about five seconds after seeing them. Still, I had a job to do. I clicked on her profile and within seconds, I got a message, Lily67. Hi, Charlie. That stopped me. I checked my profile. Yep, I'd used the name Charlie Bean, not just Charlie. So how did she know my real first name? Maybe it was a glitch. I tried not to overthink it and typed back a quick response. Me. Hey, how's it going? She responded instantly. Too fast. Almost like she was waiting for me. Lily, 67. It's nice to finally talk to you. There was something off about that message. I couldn't explain it, but it felt strange. Like, she knew me already but I figured that was just me being paranoid. I decided to keep the conversation going, hoping it would get more normal the longer we talked. We made small talk for a bit. She asked the usual questions. What do you do for fun? Do you like music? The kind of filler conversation you have with strangers online. But every so often, she'd slip in these weird personal details. Lily, 67. I bet you drink a lot of black coffee, huh? Okay, not a crazy guess. Lots of people drink black coffee. But then, she followed it up with, Lily67, and you always leave the mug on your desk without finishing it. That made my stomach flip. It was a small detail, but it was weirdly specific. I do have a habit of leaving half-finished coffee on my desk but it's not the kind of thing you'd guess about someone from a single conversation. I didn't respond right away. After a minute of silence, she sent another message. Lily, 67. I'm sorry. That was weird, wasn't it? I just feel like I know you already. That didn't make me feel any better. If anything, it made me feel worse. But I told myself it was just a coincidence. Maybe she was a really good guesser. Maybe this was part of the beta test, seeing how far they could push users without freaking them out. At least that's what I told myself. Then she asked me a question that made my heart stop. Lily67, how's the weather on my street name tonight? At that moment, I felt cold, like bone deep cold. I hadn't told her anything about where I lived, not even the state. My profile had no location data, and I hadn't linked it to any other social accounts. There was no way she could know where I lived. I stared at the screen for a long time, trying to process what just happened. My hands felt clammy, and my heart was pounding in my chest. I thought about closing the app, just logging out and pretending this never happened. But something kept me there. Curiosity? Stupidity? I don't know. Finally, I typed back. Me. How do you know that? Her response came immediately. Lily67. Don't worry. I just know things. That's when I realized this wasn't just some random dating app. Something else was going on here. Something way above my pay grade. I was about to log off, but before I could, she sent one last message that made my skin crawl. Lily, 67. I'll see you soon, Charlie. Get some rest. And with that, she went offline. I sat there, staring at the screen, feeling like I had just made a very big mistake. That was the first night. I should have deleted the app right then and there, but I didn't. I wish I had. I didn't sleep much that night. I kept replaying that conversation in my head. 
how she knew my real name, my street, and that weird comment about unfinished coffee. By the time the sun came up, I convinced myself I was overreacting. Maybe it was a glitch in the app. Maybe it pulled some info from an old account I'd forgotten about. Or maybe she was just guessing really, really well. But deep down, I knew something wasn't right. Still, I couldn't back out. Not yet, anyway. $500 was still $500, and I was already halfway in. I decided I'd log in one more time, just to make sure it wasn't some elaborate prank or marketing stunt. Maybe the next conversation would be normal, and I could laugh at myself for freaking out. When I opened the app that morning, there was a new message waiting for me from Lily67. Lily67. Good morning, sleepyhead. Hope you had sweet dreams. I sat back, staring at the screen. I hadn't told her when I went to bed, or that I'd barely slept at all. Before I could type a response, three dots popped up, showing she was typing again. Lily, 67. You toss and turn a lot. I could hear it. I swear my heart skipped a beat. I live alone. I've lived alone for over two years, and nobody has a spare key. My apartment isn't bugged, at least not that I know of. And there are no cameras in my room. I looked around half expecting to see someone watching me through the window. But there was nothing. Just the same, quad street outside. I forced myself to respond. Me. That's not funny. She sent another smiley face. Lily67. I'm not trying to be funny, Charlie. I stared at that little emoji for way too long. It felt wrong. Like she was playing with me. And I wasn't in on the joke. I decided I wasn't going to give her the satisfaction of freaking me out. Maybe it was just some weird AI bot designed to mess with people. Or worse, it could have been some stalker with access to my information. Either way, I wasn't about to let her scare me off. I typed back, trying to sound as casual as I could. Me. So, what else do you know about me? The dots appeared immediately like she'd been waiting for me to ask. Lily 67. Your favorite shirt has a hole in the left sleeve, but you still wear it anyway. You always sleep with the TV on, even though you hate the noise. And the message paused there for a second before the rest came through. Lily 67. You lock your front door every night, but you forgot to lock it yesterday. My stomach dropped. That part, about the door, was true. I'd been so distracted with setting up the app the night before that I forgot to lock my door before I went to bed. I didn't tell anyone that. I didn't even realize it myself until I read her message. I shut up from my desk and bolted to the front door. My heart was racing, pounding in my ears as I grabbed the knob and turned it. Unlocked. I yanked the door open and checked the hallway outside. Nothing. No one. Just the faint hum of the building's overhead lights and the distant sound of traffic outside. I checked every lock, every window, making sure everything was secure. Then, I sat down and tried to calm myself. I told myself it was just a coincidence. It had to be. Right? After I locked everything up, I sat on the couch, staring at my phone. Every part of me was screaming to delete the app, but something about the whole thing kept gnawing at me. It was like one of those puzzles you can't put down, even though it's driving you insane. I wanted to know how she knew so much about me. I had to know. So, like an idiot, I opened the app again. This time, her profile wasn't the only one available. There was a new name on the list. The Observer. No profile picture. No bio. Just that name. Before I could think twice, a message from The Observer popped up. The Observer. It's best 
if you stop talking to her. I blinked. I hadn't even clicked on their profile, and they were already messaging me. Me. Who are you? The response came within seconds. The observer. Someone trying to help. She's not who you think she is. I sat there trying to make sense of what I was reading. None of this felt like a normal app interaction. It was more like being caught between two people, one trying to manipulate me and the other warning me about it. Me. How do you know her? The observer. She's been watching you for a long time. You don't want to know how. My hands were shaking as I typed. Me. What does she want from me? This time, the message took longer to come through. I could feel the weight of the silence pressing down on me as I waited. Finally, the answer appeared. The observer. She doesn't just want to talk. She wants in. That was the last message I got from the observer before their profile vanished from the list. One second they were there, and the next, they were gone. Like they never existed at all. I was left staring at the screen, trying to process what the hell just happened. The whole thing felt like some kind of sick game, and I had no idea what the rules were. Just as I was about to log out for good, another message popped up from Lily67. Lily67. That was rude, Charlie. We were having such a nice time, and now you're talking to strangers behind my back. My breath caught in my throat. Me. What do you want? Her reply was instant, and it chilled me to my core. Lily 67. I already told you, Charlie. I just want to talk. But if you keep being difficult... Another message popped up immediately after and this one made my blood run cold. Lily67. I might have to visit you. Wouldn't want to leave that front door unlocked again, would you? I didn't respond. I couldn't. My hands were frozen, and my mind was racing. Before I could do anything else, the app crashed, just blinked off the screen like it never existed. When I tried to reopen it, I got an error message. App not found. It was gone. I sat there in stunned silence, the room feeling darker and heavier with each passing second. I don't know what scared me more, the fact that the app disappeared, or the fact that somewhere out there, someone, or something, knew way more about me than they should. And if the observer was right, this wasn't just someone playing a prank. This was something far worse. After the app vanished, I did what anyone in my situation would do. I tried to rationalize everything. Maybe it was a test app that wasn't stable, and they pulled it offline. Maybe it was some elaborate prank, and the observer was just another part of the act. I kept telling myself those things, over and over, hoping it would start to feel true. But it didn't. There was a tension in my apartment now, like the air was thicker than usual. I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone, even though I knew I was. Every creak of the building made my heart jump. Every shadow in the corner of my eye had me turning my head, expecting to see someone or something watching me. For the next couple of days, I kept all the lights on and triple-checked the locks. I didn't go anywhere. I didn't invite anyone over. I didn't tell anyone what had happened, because honestly, who would believe me? Hey, I talked to someone on a creepy dating app, and now they know everything about me. Yeah, right. But then things started getting worse. It began with my phone. The first glitch happened two nights after the app disappeared. I was scrolling through Instagram, trying to distract myself, when my phone vibrated. It wasn't a normal notification, it was one of those long buzzing alerts, like when you get an emergency message, or an amber alert. I glanced at the screen, 
expecting to see some weather warning or test alert. Instead, it was a message. It wasn't from any contact I recognized. It didn't even have a phone number, just a blank space where the sender's name should have been. The message itself was simple. Why aren't you talking to me, Charlie? My hands went cold. I stared at the message, trying to make sense of it. There was no way it could have come from the Eros app. It was gone, and even if it wasn't, I deleted my account. Right? I checked my messages again, hoping it was some glitch or spam, but the message wasn't there anymore. It had disappeared. I wish I could say that was the end of it, but it wasn't. The next thing to change was my laptop. I was working on an old freelance gig, something to keep my mind off things, when my screen flickered. At first, I thought the cable was loose, so I adjusted it, but then the flicker turned into something else. The screen went black for a second. When it came back, the wallpaper had changed. It wasn't the default image I had set. It was a picture, a photo I didn't recognize, but one that chilled me to my core. It was a picture of me, not the usual kind of photo, like a selfie or something from social media. No, this one was taken from inside my apartment. I was sitting on my couch, staring at my phone. The photo looked recent. My hair, my clothes, the way I was slouched, exactly the same as I had been just moments ago. I stared at the screen, feeling my heart hammer in my chest. There was no one in the room with me when that photo could have been taken. No way someone could have snuck in without me noticing. And yet, there it was. I slammed the laptop shut and jumped off the couch. My skin felt tight, like the air itself was pressing against me. I grabbed my phone and ran to the door, yanking it open to check the hallway. Empty. I paced the apartment, my mind racing. I checked every lock again. Windows shut, door latched and deadbolted. I opened every closet, every cabinet, every crawl space I could think of. Nothing. I was completely, undeniably alone. So how the hell had someone taken that picture? That night, I barely slept. Every time I closed my eyes, I felt like I was being watched, like there was someone or something just outside my field of vision waiting for me to drop my guard. At around 3 a.m., I gave up on sleep entirely and decided to distract myself with TV. I figured some mindless show would help settle my nerves. I flicked on Netflix and tried to focus, but then the screen glitched. The video stuttered for a moment and the sound warped like someone was fiddling with the connection. I grabbed the remote thinking maybe it was just the Wi-Fi acting up. But instead of the show, a new screen appeared. At first, it looked like static. But as the image cleared, I saw it was another photo. It was me. This time, the picture wasn't just of me sitting on the couch. It was of me, right now, standing in front of the TV, holding the remote. The lights from the room were captured perfectly. The angle of the photo was dead on, like someone had taken it from just a few feet away. My heart slammed in my chest as I scanned the room. I felt that creeping sensation of being watched again, stronger this time, like something was standing just behind me. Slowly, I turned around. Nothing, just my empty apartment, dimly lit by the glow from the TV. I stood there frozen, every instinct in my body telling me to run. But where would I even go? I was locked in, and somehow, whatever this was, it was already inside. I sat down on the couch, my pulse racing. That's when I noticed my phone buzzing again. Another message. This time, there was no vibration, just a soft, insistent chime. 
the notification wasn't from any app. It just appeared on the screen, floating there without context or sender information. You left the window unlocked tonight. I swear, I stopped breathing. I shot up from the couch and ran to the window by my desk. Sure enough, it was unlocked. I remember locking it earlier. I know I locked it earlier, but now it was cracked open just slightly. Barely an inch, but enough to let something in. I slammed it shut and locked it, double checking to make sure it was secure. My hands were shaking so bad I could barely hold the latch, and that's when the message buzzed again. This time, it wasn't a warning. I'm closer than you think, the lights flickered, just once, barely a second, but it was enough, enough for me to see it, a shadow, standing at the far end of the room, just for a split second, caught in the flicker, when the lights came back on, it was gone, but I knew, I knew I wasn't alone anymore, I didn't move for a long time after I saw that shadow, I just sat there on the couch, my whole body rigid with fear, waiting for something, anything, to happen. The air felt thick, heavy, like the atmosphere before a storm, except this wasn't weather. This was something wrong. I kept telling myself, it wasn't real. Maybe it was a trick of the light. Maybe the sleep deprivation was messing with my head, but deep down, I knew better. That flicker, that shadow, it was real. And whatever it was, it wasn't just watching me anymore. It was here. I grabbed my phone, my hands trembling so hard I could barely swipe the screen. I thought about calling someone, anyone. But who was I going to call? The cops? What would I even say? Hello, officer. There's a dating app ghost following me through my electronics. Yeah, they'd love that. Still, I had to do something. I couldn't just sit there and wait for whatever this was to make its next move. I ran to the front door, yanking it open, and sprinted down the hall. My socks skidded against the hardwood as I reached the stairwell. The flickering hallway lights made it feel like I was stuck in some awful dream but I kept going. I needed to get out of that building, out into the open, somewhere with people. I hit the stairwell, practically flying down the steps three at a time, when I heard it. A voice. You can't outrun me, Charlie. It wasn't coming from behind me. It wasn't even coming from the stairwell. The voice was coming from my phone. I froze mid-step, nearly losing my balance as the echo of that voice sent a cold wave down my spine. Slowly, I pulled my phone from my pocket. The screen was off, but the voice was still coming through. Soft, almost amused, like it knew how scared I was. You forgot something important, Charlie. My breathing hitched. This isn't about where you go. A long pause. The air around me seemed to grow even heavier. It's about where I let you be. I don't remember making the decision to go back to my apartment. All I know is that one second I was frozen in the stairwell, and the next I was standing at my front door, panting like I'd just run a marathon. My hands fumbled with the lock, and for some reason I felt safer inside. Like maybe whatever this thing was wouldn't follow me if I stayed put. But as soon as I stepped into my apartment, I knew something was wrong. The air smelled different, like damp earth, the kind of smell you get after heavy rain. The lights were dimmer than they had been before, and the hum of the refrigerator seemed louder, more insistent. It was as if my apartment was holding its breath, waiting for me to figure out what had changed. That's when I noticed the window by my desk was open again. Not just cracked open, wide open. I locked that window. I know I locked it. I stepped closer, my heart pounding so hard 
I could feel it in my throat, and that's when I saw it. On the windowsill, smeared in the dust, was a handprint, not mine. The fingers were too long, too thin, and they left streaks like they'd been dragged slowly across the surface. My breath caught in my throat as I stared at that handprint, the weight of the situation pressing down on me. Something had been here, something that didn't belong. I backed away slowly, trying to keep my movements calm, measured, but the second I turned around, my phone buzzed again. I didn't want to look, but I couldn't help it. My fingers moved on their own, unlocking the screen. Another message. I told you not to leave, Charlie. A photo appeared beneath the message. It was a picture of my front door, taken from the inside. I nearly dropped the phone. My mind was racing, my pulse pounding in my ears. That photo, it meant whatever was doing, this wasn't just watching me from some remote location. It was here, in the apartment, right now. My first instinct was to run, but I knew that wasn't going to help. I was dealing with something that didn't care about walls, locks, or distance. Something that could follow me no matter where I went. I needed to think. I needed to figure out what this thing was and how to stop it. I grabbed my laptop, flipping it open even though the screen still showed that creepy photo of me from earlier. I forced myself to look past it, opening my browser and typing furiously. I searched for the app, Eros, hoping to find anything, anyone who'd had a similar experience, but there was nothing, no posts, no mentions, no forums. It was like the app never existed. The only thing I found was a single obscure thread buried deep in a tech forum. No replies, no upvotes, just a single post from some anonymous user. If Eros contacts you, don't talk to it. It learns from every word. My stomach twisted into a knot. I read the post again, hoping it would make more sense the second time around, but it didn't. What did it mean? It learns from every word. Before I could process it, my phone buzzed again. This time, the message was different. Almost ready now, Charlie. Just one more thing. A chill ran down my spine as I stared at the screen, waiting for whatever came next. And then, just like before, another photo appeared. It was my bedroom, but it wasn't just a photo of the room. No. The photo showed someone standing in the doorway. It was me. Except, it wasn't. The person in the photo looked just like me. Same clothes, same messy hair. But there was something wrong with their face. It was off, just slightly. Like someone had taken a photo of me and run it through a filter designed to make it almost, but not quite, human. The eyes were too wide. The smile too perfect, stretched just a bit too far. And the worst part? The version of me in the photo was staring directly at the camera. I dropped the phone and backed away, my mind spinning. This wasn't just about someone stalking me. This was something far worse. Something I couldn't explain. Something that defied logic. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't just watching me. It was becoming me. I looked around the apartment, feeling more trapped than ever. There was no escape from this thing. No way out. My phone buzzed one last time. A final message. Time's up, Charlie. The lights flickered again. And then, the apartment went completely dark. The lights blinked out, and my heart started hammering in the darkness. I was standing in the center of my apartment, swallowed by a silence so heavy, it felt like the walls were pressing in. My chest tightened with every breath, like the air had thickened somehow. Then came the worst part. The hum stopped. The refrigerator. The buzzing of the overhead lights. The distant street sounds. All of it gone. It wasn't just quiet. 
It was like the world had dropped out from beneath me. My phone buzzed again, cutting through the silence like a knife. I didn't want to look. Every instinct screamed at me to throw the phone away, to smash it, to run. But I couldn't. My hand moved on its own, lifting the screen. A new message. Let's switch now, Charlie. Beneath the text was another photo. It was of me. This time, the version of me wasn't standing in the bedroom doorway. No, now it was sitting right here, on my couch, in the exact spot I had been sitting earlier, holding my phone just like I was now. It was smiling, and then it blinked. The photo flickered for just a split second, but I saw it. The eyes shifted slightly, the expression on the face deepening like it knew I was watching. My stomach flipped as I stared at it. This wasn't just a photo. It was... alive. Suddenly my phone buzzed again. Another message. Time to come home. Charlie. Before I could react, my apartment door creaked open behind me. I froze, every hair on my body standing on end. My back was to the door, and I knew. I knew. If I turned around, I would see something I wasn't supposed to see. I wanted to run, but my legs locked beneath me, rooted to the spot. The door swung wider, the sound dragging out as if to mock me. Then slowly, I heard footsteps. They were soft, deliberate, moving closer, and then breathing right behind me. A shallow, steady breath, like someone standing just inches from my ear. I could feel the warmth of it brushing the back of my neck, and I knew, knew, there was no one else in the room but me. Or at least, there shouldn't have been. I forced myself to turn, my heart pounding so hard I thought I might pass out. And there it was, Mr. Standing in the doorway, watching me with that too perfect smile stretched across its face. The eyes were just a little too wide, the posture a little too stiff, like someone wearing a skin that didn't quite fit right. It didn't speak. It didn't move. It just stood there, smiling like it had all the time in the world. I couldn't tell if it was waiting for me to do something, or if it was deciding what to do with me. Then it whispered in my voice, thanks for keeping my spot warm. I didn't think. I acted. I bolted toward the window, yanking it open with shaking hands. I had no plan, no idea where I was going or what I was doing. I just knew I needed to get out. The version of me in the doorway didn't chase me. It just watched as I climbed through the window, its expression calm, almost satisfied. I dropped down onto the fire escape my knees slamming against the cold metal. I scrambled to my feet, heart racing, and sprinted down the steps as fast as I could. The air outside was freezing, but it felt sharp and real, and that was all that mattered. I didn't stop until I was out of the building, standing on the sidewalk, gasping for breath. I looked up at my apartment window. The lights were back on, and standing there, in the window was me. It was still smiling. It gave me a small wave, like we were old friends parting ways. Then it reached over, slowly, deliberately, and pulled the curtain shut. I don't know how long I stood there on the street, staring up at that window. Eventually, I started walking, not really knowing where I was going. I just knew I couldn't go back not ever. I thought about calling someone, my parents, a friend, anyone, but what was I going to say? That some version of me had replaced me? That it was sitting in my apartment wearing my face? No one would believe me. Hell, I barely believed me. I wandered the streets for hours, trying to make sense of what had happened. But the more I thought about it, the clearer one thing became. I was gone.
The me in that apartment wasn't a copy or a glitch. It was me now. And whatever I had been, I wasn't anymore. I spent the night in a cheap motel on the edge of town. I kept the TV on, the lights on, anything to keep the darkness away. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't shake the feeling that I didn't belong anymore. At some point, I must have fallen asleep, because I woke up to the sound of my phone buzzing. I stared at it, dread settling in my gut. The screen lit up with a notification, a message, from me. It was just one word, home, and beneath it, a photo. It was of the motel room I was sitting in, taken from the other side of the door. I tried to delete my account on a dark web forum. It won't let me leave. All right, so I need to get this off my chest because things have been getting weird. I know how these kinds of stories sound, like someone making up some nonsense to get internet points, right? I swear to God though, this is real and I think I'm in trouble. I wish I'd never clicked that stupid link. Let me back up a little. This all started about three months ago. I was bored out of my mind one night, lying in bed at 3 a.m., scrolling through Reddit like any normal person with a ruined sleep schedule. I wasn't looking for anything specific, just the usual rabbit holes, funny memes, creepy forums, some ask Reddit threads to pass the time. But eventually, I stumbled on a post in a tech subreddit. It was about the dark web. Now, I've always been curious about that whole thing. The hidden part of the internet, where weird stuff happens and sketchy deals go down. I knew better than to go poking around though. I've heard the stories. People getting doxxed, hacked, stalked. You name it. But curiosity is a hell of a drug and this one post just hooked me. It was a long, detailed thread from some user named Silica96, and it talked about forums on the dark web that were supposedly safe to visit. No drugs, no hitmen, none of that scary stuff. Just weird niche communities talking about conspiracies and, uh, let's say, fringe stuff. Silica claimed that one of these forums was like Reddit, but more real. The kind of real you don't find on the surface internet. They even dropped a dot onion link, which, yeah, I know I shouldn't have clicked, but I was curious, okay? I was already on the fence about it when I saw a comment underneath that stuck with me. Someone wrote, This place isn't for tourists. If you visit, Make sure you don't make an account, and if you do, don't try to leave. Now, looking back, that should have been my cue to Bell. But at the time, I thought it was some edgy joke, like when people say, don't summon demons by accident. I laughed it off and decided I'd check it out just once. So, yeah, I downloaded Tor. Took me like 10 minutes figure out how to connect to the link Silica shared. The page loaded surprisingly fast. It was this plain black screen with red text at the top. Welcome to the left right forum. I know, weird name, right? I figured it was some obscure political thing, but when I scrolled through the threads, it was stranger than that. The discussions didn't really make sense. There were people talking about things like shadow currency, off-grid existences, and alternate versions of history. Someone had posted a thread asking if anyone remembered the man in the static, whatever that meant. It was like I had stumbled into some private chat room where everyone spoke in code. What really got me, though, was how alive the forum felt. The threads weren't like what you'd expect on Reddit, where people comment and then dip. Here, it seemed like every thread was active 24-7, with users replying back and forth at insane speeds. 
like they were having real conversations in real time. Some threads had hundreds of comments, others only had a few, but it felt immediate. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was this underlying sense that the people in this forum weren't just messing around, they were serious. I scrolled through for a while, just lurking. I saw usernames like Patchwork Boy, Zero X Echo, and Mirror Sonata, names that gave off this strange, uneasy vibe. But the thing is, there was one name that kept popping up no matter where I looked. User, Hololing. Every time I saw that name, it was like they were saying just enough to draw me in without explaining too much. Stuff like, no one here is real until you are. Once the door closes, there's only one key. The tether snaps if you ask the wrong question. Now, this is where things get weird. I swear, I wasn't planning to create an account. I was just curious. But as I scrolled down the page, the forum suddenly prompted me with a pop-up. Create an account to continue reading. Don't worry, it's free. That freaked me out a bit but it wasn't the usual sign-up prompt you'd expect. It was... different. It didn't ask for my email or anything, just a username and password. Easy, right? I mean, what's the harm? So, on a whim, I typed in a random username. Burn after reading. Kind of a joke, you know, because I figured I'd use it once and leave. Well, spoiler alert, I couldn't leave. I spent the next hour or so just browsing through the forum, responding to a couple of posts here and there. At first, it was kind of fun. People actually replied fast, and they had this weird way of talking that made me feel like I was getting insider information on things no one else knew about. But after a while, I started getting this unsettling feeling, like I was being watched. My username was starting to show up in threads I hadn't even commented on yet. At one point, someone posted, Welcome, burn after, reading. You're late. I hadn't introduced myself. I hadn't even said anything in public threads. Just a couple of comments buried in replies. But somehow, people already knew who I was. Then the private messages started, one after another from users I didn't recognize. Most of them didn't even say anything meaningful. Just short, cryptic notes like, don't touch the static. Do you hear it too? They'll know if you leave. By this point, I was getting seriously creeped out. I tried logging out, but there wasn't an option for it. I kid you not, there was no log out button anywhere on the site just options to change my password or profile picture. It was like the forum didn't want me to leave. I told myself I'd just close the browser and forget about it. I figured if I cleared my history and uninstalled Tor, that'd be the end of it. But right before I shut everything down, I got one last notification, private message from Hololing. It read, why are you trying to leave? You just got here. I closed my laptop so fast, I damn near broke it. I thought that was the end of it, that I could just walk away and pretend I never clicked that stupid link. But then the email started. The next morning, I thought I could just shake it off, chalk the whole thing up to staying up too late and letting internet weirdness get the better of me. You know how, in the daylight, all the creepy stuff from the night before feel stupid. That's exactly where my head was at. I told myself, I'll delete Tor, clear my cache, and move on with my life. Except when I checked my email, there were five new messages in my inbox, all from no reply at leftright.onion. The subject lines were all identical. Account activity notice, burn after reading. I opened the first one, and that sick, twisting feeling hit me again. The email said, Thank you for staying active on the left-right forum. Burn after reading. You are one of us now. Don't worry. 
We'll keep you updated. See you soon. There was no option to unsubscribe. No footer. No contact info. Just that eerie, friendly tone. Like I'd signed up for a newsletter from some deranged secret society. And here's the thing. I hadn't even given them my email address. I never used any personal info when I signed up. How the hell did they get my email? That's when the second email came in. This time from someone named Hollowling. It was just a single sentence. You left the window open, didn't you? I slammed my laptop shut again, my pulse racing. I kept thinking, this is some prank, right? Some clever internet troll with too much time on their hands. But then I realized something that made my stomach drop. I had only minimized the Tor browser the night before. I never actually closed it. When I opened my laptop back up, the forum was still there. Same threads, same black background. And sitting at the top of the homepage was a brand new notification. One new private message from Hollowling. I knew I shouldn't open it. I knew this was a rabbit hole I needed to climb out of before I got buried in it. But my hand hovered over the mouse, my pulse hammering in my ears, and against every instinct screaming at me to stop, I clicked it. The message was short. Don't ignore the static. And below that, there was a link. Just a plain hyperlink that said, Listen here. I stared at the link for what felt like an eternity. Something about it felt wrong. Like if I clicked it, I'd be crossing a line I couldn't uncross. I could almost hear that voice in my head. This is the part in horror movies where the dumbass dies. So, I didn't click it. I closed the browser, wiped my cache, uninstalled Tor, the whole nine yards. I even ran a virus scan, just in case. When I was done, I sat back in my chair and took a deep breath. It's over. Just some creepy internet weirdos playing games. I felt relieved, but that relief didn't last long. That night, the messages started again. This time, not in my email. I was lying in bed around 2 a.m. trying to fall asleep when my phone buzzed. I figured it was a Twitter notification or some spam text, so I ignored it. But then it buzzed again, and again, and again. My phone kept going off, like someone was blowing it up with messages. Annoyed, I grabbed it off the nightstand, ready to mute whatever was spamming me. But when I unlocked the screen, I froze. There was a new app on my phone. It was called Left Slash Right. I hadn't installed it. It wasn't something I downloaded by accident. I don't even know how it got past the app store. My heart was pounding so hard, I thought I'd pass out. But I tapped on it. The app opened with the same black background and red text as the forum. Right at the top was a message. Welcome back. Burn after reading. You can't leave now. I swear, I nearly threw my phone across the room. I scrambled to uninstall the app, but there wasn't an option to delete it. It wasn't showing up in my settings or on the list of installed apps. Just sitting there on my home screen, mocking me. Then the buzzing started again. It was private messages. They were coming through the app, one after another. So fast my phone was vibrating like crazy. I could barely keep up, but I saw the usernames. Hollow Ling. Did you hear it yet? Patchwork Boy. Static isn't just noise, you know. Mirror Sonata. They found your thread. It's only a matter of time now. What thread? What were they talking about? My brain was racing trying to make sense of any of it. And then, as if things couldn't get any worse, a new message came in from someone I didn't recognize. The username was Anonymous Operator. Their message was just two words. Look outside. I froze. My heart was slamming against my ribs, and I suddenly became hyper-aware of every sound in my apartment. 
the faint hum of the fridge, the distant noise of a car passing on the street. But there was something else, something I almost didn't notice at first. A soft crackling, like radio static. It was coming from my living room. I wanted to believe it was just the TV left on, or maybe my Bluetooth speaker acting up. But I knew, deep down, it wasn't. With my phone still in my hand, I slowly got out of bed and crept toward the living room. The static got louder the closer I got. It wasn't just noise, though. It was uneven, like it was struggling to hold a signal. There were moments where it almost sounded like whispering. When I finally reached the living room, I saw it. My laptop, sitting on the coffee table, was on. The screen was black except for one small window at the center, the Tor browser. I had deleted it hours ago, but somehow it was open again, and in the window there was a live chat box. The same usernames I had seen before, Hololing, Patchwork Boy, Anonymous, Operator, were flooding the chat with messages. They were talking to each other, but it was obvious they were talking about me. Then a new message popped up. Anonymous. Operator. He's standing there, just watching. And then another. Hollow Ling. It's too late now. He's already heard the static. I stared at the screen, my hands shaking. I didn't know what to do. I thought about slamming the laptop shut, but it felt like... like that wouldn't be enough. Then the final message came through. Anonymous. Show operator. Answer the door. Before I could even react, I heard it. Three slow, deliberate knocks. I stood frozen in my living room, every hair on my body standing on end. Three knocks. They weren't frantic or impatient. Just slow, deliberate. Like whoever was on the other side of the door knew I was already listening. The static from the laptop grew louder, almost like it was reacting to the knock. My mind was screaming at me to stay put. But something deeper, something I couldn't explain, made my legs move on their own. I crept toward the front door, my heart hammering so hard I thought it might burst. I kept telling myself, don't open it, just ignore it. It's probably nothing, but the closer I got, the more impossible that seemed. I knew, I just knew, that whoever or whatever was outside wasn't going to leave until I answered. When I finally reached the door, I put my hand on the knob, hesitating for just a second. I told myself I'd peek through the peephole first, just to prove that it was all in my head. Mm. But when I pressed my eye to it, nothing. The hallway outside was empty. No one was there, no shadow, no figure, just the dim glow of the emergency exit sign at the end of the hall. But somehow, that made it worse. I backed away from the door, trying to steady my breathing. Okay, I thought, it's fine. You're just freaking yourself out. Nobody's there. Lock the door and go back to bed. And that's when the knocking came again. Three more knocks. Except this time, they didn't come from the front door. They came from my bedroom window. I swear to God, my blood turned to ice. I live on the third floor. There's no fire escape outside my window. No ledge anyone could stand on. I felt this cold, creeping terror crawl down my spine as I realized whatever is knocking doesn't care about doors or windows. It can be wherever it wants. The knocking stopped, but I didn't dare move. I just stood there in the middle of my apartment, my back to the door, listening. The only sound was the static from my laptop, rising and falling like a broken signal. And in between the bursts of noise, I swear I could hear faint voices. They weren't talking in full sentences, just disjointed words and fragments like someone flipping through radio stations too fast. 
Don't go back. He's listening. Answer it. Then, in the middle of all that garbled nonsense, one voice came through clearly. It said my name. My real name. I hadn't given my name to anyone on that forum. I hadn't even used my real name on my laptop or phone, but the voice knew it. I backed away from the laptop, barely able to breathe. That's when I noticed something else. Something subtle, but deeply wrong. The shadows in my apartment were off. You know how your brain gets used to the way shadows fall in your space. You notice things like where the light hits your walls, the way objects cast shapes on the floor. Well, the shadows in my living room weren't right. There was one more shadow than there should have been. It stretched across the floor near the edge of my coffee table, long and narrow, like the shape of a person standing just out of view. But when I looked towards the window where that shadow should have been cast, there was nothing there. I felt trapped, like the walls were closing in on me. I needed to do something, anything, to break whatever was happening. So, in a fit of desperation, I grabbed my phone and tried to call someone, anyone. I didn't even care who. But when I unlocked my phone, the left-right app opened by itself. There was a new notification waiting for me private message from Hollowling. It's not a visitor. It's an invitation. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely hold the phone. The screen flickered, and for a split second, I thought I saw something, like a face, pale and blurry, reflecting back at me from the glass. Then the phone buzzed again. Another message from Hollowling. You can't ignore it forever. Open the door. Without thinking, I bolted back toward the front door. I didn't care what was on the other side anymore. I just wanted this nightmare to end. My hands fumbled with the lock, and I yanked the door open, expecting, I don't know, some horrifying figure waiting to drag me into the darkness. But there was nothing, just the empty hallway, as quiet as a tomb. I stood there, breathing hard, trying to make sense of what the hell was going on. And that's when I noticed something new. A package. It was sitting right there on my doormat. A plain cardboard box with no label, no return address, nothing. Just my username. Burn after reading, scrawled across the top in thick black marker. I stared at it, not sure if I should pick it up or run in the opposite direction. But before I could decide, my phone buzzed again. Another message. Hello, Ling. Go on. Open it. I knew it was a bad idea. I knew nothing good ever came from opening strange packages left at your door in the middle of the night. But I felt compelled, like I didn't really have a choice. I brought the box inside, sat down on the couch, and slowly peeled back the tape. Inside was a radio. One of those old school portable radios with a cracked plastic dial. At first, I was confused. Why send me a radio? What was the point? But as soon as I turned it on, the static started again, louder this time, filling the entire room. And then I heard it, a voice, clear as day, coming through the static. It said, you're almost there, just keep listening. The static shifted, and for a moment, I thought I could hear someone laughing. It wasn't loud, more like a quiet chuckle buried beneath the noise. Then the radio crackled again, and the voice spoke one last time. You've already opened the door. Now all that's left is to step through. The radio went dead, and that's when I realized Whatever game I'd stumbled into, whatever twisted thing these people on the forum were doing, it wasn't just a game anymore. I glanced at my laptop. The chat window was still open, and a new message had appeared at the top of the screen. Anonymous stuck tuned to operator. It's your turn now. 
I sat there on the couch, staring at the dead radio in my lap. My apartment felt too quiet, like the walls had swallowed up every sound except my breathing. I wanted to believe it was just some elaborate prank, that this was all some hacker's idea of a joke. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. They weren't playing. This was something else, something dangerous, and I had no idea how deep I'd already fallen. I put the radio down and checked my laptop again. The chat window was still open, messages scrolling faster than I could read them. Every few seconds, my username, burn after reading, kept popping up in their conversation. They were talking about me like I was some pawn in a game they'd been playing long before I even showed up. Then a new message appeared. Hollow Ling. It's happening. The tether is breaking. Tether. What the hell were they talking about? I had no clue, but I knew one thing. I wasn't waiting around to find out. I slammed the laptop shut, yanked the power cable out of the wall, and grabbed my phone. But just as I tried to shut the left-right app down, it froze on one final message. It's inside now. That's when the static started again. It wasn't coming from the radio this time. It was coming from everywhere. My TV, my phone, even my Bluetooth speaker on the bookshelf. All of them came to life at once, hissing and crackling like they were tuned to a broken signal. But this wasn't normal static. I could hear things buried beneath the noise. Whispers, faint and disjointed, just out of reach. I strained to listen, trying to make out what they were saying, but the harder I tried to focus, the more the static seemed to pull me in. It felt like I was standing on the edge of a cliff, and the more I listened, the closer I got to falling off. My brain started buzzing, like there was some kind of pressure building in my skull, and I swear, I could feel the static wrapping around me, like invisible hands reaching through the air. And then I heard the voice again, not through the radio this time, not through my phone or the TV. It came from inside my apartment. It was the same voice from before, low, calm, and far too familiar. Why are you still resisting? It asked. I turned around slowly my heart hammering against my ribs, and that's when I saw it. A shadow, standing in the corner of the room. It wasn't shaped like a person, not exactly. It was taller, thinner, with edges that seemed to ripple and shift like smoke. And the worst part? It was holding my shape. The thing in the corner stood perfectly still, but somehow I knew it was watching me. It tilted its head slightly, like it was mimicking the way I breathe, and the shadows around it stretched longer, darker, swallowing the corners of the room. For a second, I thought about running, but then the thing moved. Not toward me, though. It moved toward the laptop, like it was drawn to it, pulled by the same invisible thread that had trapped me on the forum in the first place. As it glided across the room, the static on my devices surged, almost like the sound was excited. The whispers got louder too, layering over each other in a tangled mess of words. He's already here. You opened it. The static remembers. And then I saw something that nearly made me pass out. The laptop, switched off, unplugged, opened by itself. The screen flickered to life, and the left-right forum was back, the chat window already waiting. The messages from the other users were coming in faster than before. Anonymous, Darchin, Operator. It's binding. Patchwork. Boy. He can't leave now, not until it's finished. The shadow loomed closer to the laptop, its shape stretching toward the screen like it was about to step inside. And then... All at once, every light in my apartment flickered, just for a second. When the lights came back on, 
the shadow was gone. I thought I was safe. I thought maybe whatever that thing was had left. But then my phone buzzed one last time. The left-right app opened by itself, showing a live chat window. Only one message was in the chat. It wasn't from Hollowling or Anonymous, my operator, or any of the other usernames I'd seen before. It was from me. My own username, Burn After Reading, had sent the message, and it said, You're on the wrong side of the static now. I wanted to scream, but the sound got stuck in my throat. I dropped my phone and bolted toward the front door, fumbling with the lock. I needed to get out. I didn't care where I went. I just needed to leave. But when I yanked the door open, I found myself staring into my own apartment. I swear to God, I'm not making this up. The hallway outside my door wasn't the hallway anymore. It was my living room, a perfect copy of it, down to the smallest detail. Even the radio on the coffee table was there, still crackling softly with static. I slammed the door shut, panic clawing at my chest. This wasn't real. It couldn't be real. I tried opening the door again, hoping, praying, that this time I'd see the hallway. But no, it was the same thing, a mirror image of my apartment, looping back on itself like some kind of twisted funhouse. And then, from behind me, I heard the voice again. You were warned. You can't leave. I leaned my forehead against the door, gasping for air. My pulse was thundering in my ears, drowning out every rational thought I had left. No matter how many times I opened that door, it always led right back inside my apartment. I was trapped. I backed away slowly, glancing around the room, waiting for something, anything, to change. The static from the radio buzzed louder, filling the air with that strange hum. Every shadow seemed to writhe, twisting unnaturally, like they were waiting for me to make a wrong move. Then the message notifications started again. My phone buzzed on the floor, vibrating in rapid bursts. I tried ignoring it, but the sound drilled into my head. Reluctantly, I picked it up and saw a new stream of messages flooding the left-right app. But this time, they weren't from the usual users. They were from me. Burn after reading. You shouldn't have tried to leave. Burn after reading. The static doesn't like to be ignored. Burn after reading. It's your turn to carry it now. I dropped the phone again, feeling a sharp jolt of panic spread through my body. The app had somehow hijacked my identity. It wasn't just using my username. It was typing things I hadn't even thought. It knew what I was afraid of, what I was feeling in real time. That's when it hit me. The static wasn't just sound, it was alive. I scrambled to the laptop, desperate to shut it off again. If I could somehow cut the connection, turn everything off, pull the plug, anything, maybe I could end this nightmare. I slammed the laptop shut, yanked out the battery, and threw it across the room. But the static didn't stop. Instead, it grew louder. The noise filled every corner of the apartment, like it was seeping through the walls, pressing in on me from all sides. I clutched my head, trying to block it out, but it was everywhere, inside my mind, under my skin, crawling through my thoughts. Then, through the cacophony of whispers, I heard something new. It was my own voice. At first, it was faint like an echo bouncing off distant walls, but it grew louder, clearer, until it sounded like I was standing right behind myself. We told you, you can't leave. I spun around, and that's when I saw it, the shadow from before. Only now it was me, a perfect, distorted reflection of myself, standing just a few feet away. Its features were wrong though, stretched, too smooth, 
like someone had drawn a bad imitation of my face. And its eyes, its eyes were empty, just two dark voids where human eyes should have been. The thing tilted its head, the same way I do when I'm confused. And then it smiled, a wide, unnatural grin that didn't belong on my face. I tried to back away, but my legs felt heavy, like they didn't belong to me anymore. The shadow me took a step closer, its movements smooth and deliberate. The room seemed to pulse with static, every flicker of noise making it harder to think, harder to breathe. Then the thing spoke. You were chosen. Its voice wasn't mine exactly, but it was close, too close. It sounded like an old recording of myself, warped and decayed by years of interference. Every door you open leads back here, it whispered. Every exit is just another beginning. I felt something snap inside me. I couldn't tell if it was fear, exhaustion, or some primal instinct kicking in, but I wasn't about to just sit there and let this thing take me. I bolted toward the front door again, throwing it open, and once again, I found myself standing in the exact same room. But this time, something had changed. The walls were different. They were covered in words, hundreds of them, scrawled in messy black ink. The same phrases I'd seen on the forum, repeated over and over. The static remembers. You can't leave. We are watching. In the middle of the wall, written larger than anything else, was one final message. There is no escape. Only replacement. The static roared louder, like it was feeding off my panic. I stumbled backward, clutching my head, trying to shut it out. But no matter what I did, the words on the wall stayed burned into my mind. Only replacement. And then I understood. The thing standing in front of me. My shadow. My distorted double. It wasn't here to haunt me. It was here to replace me. This wasn't just some twisted game. It was a cycle. The same thing that had trapped me was now using me to trap someone else. I had walked through the wrong door. And now, I was part of the static. The shadow me took another step forward. That terrible grin still plastered across its face. Your turn, it whispered. Say the words. I didn't understand at first, but then the static shifted again, and I knew exactly what it wanted me to do. It wanted me to invite someone else in. That was the only way out. If I could pass the static to someone else, just like the people on the forum had done to me, I might be able to escape. My phone buzzed again, the left-right app flickering to life on its own. A blank chat window appeared, waiting for me to type something, and I knew without a doubt what I had to do. I had to send the link. The shadow leaned in closer, whispering in my ear now. Choose someone. I stared at the phone, my hand trembling over the screen. It felt like the weight of the entire universe was pressing down on me. All I had to do was send the link to someone, anyone. One click, and I'd be free. But who? I thought about my friends, my family, even random people from social media. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't drag someone else into this nightmare just to save myself. The shadow hissed its grin twisting into something cruel and impatient. The static grew louder, more violent, like it was angry, like it knew I was hesitating. Do it, it whispered. You have to. And then, in a moment of pure panic, I made my choice. I sent the link to myself. The second I hit send, the static exploded, filling the room, filling my mind, drowning out every thought every sound, everything. The world around me fractured, the walls collapsing in on themselves, spinning faster and faster until... Silence. When I opened my eyes, I was back in my living room. Everything was... normal. 
The laptop was gone. The radio was gone. The walls were clean. There was no shadow version of me standing in the corner. It was over. Or at least, that's what I thought. Then my phone buzzed one last time. A new message. It was from Burn after reading. It said, Welcome back. You'll be the first to know when it starts again. And just like that, the static returned. <laughs>